Very thank you uh, for, for hanging on. Uh, a long afternoon, nearly the uh, end of the week. Uh, so, so my name is Tim Brooke. I work for IBM uh, in, in London. Uh, my background is as an engineer in construction and engineering, uh, energy assets, and, and what have you. Uh, so I've, I've come from, from the, the construction sector, and I've seen the light about digital technology, and I work for, for IBM. Um, in terms of blockchain itself, IBM is, is clearly a leading uh, developer, the founding uh, contributor of the, the Linux Foundation Hyperledger project, uh, out of which came Fabric, which is the actual blockchain. Uh, and we work globally, uh, and we have built thousands now, probably it's quite hard to keep up with the um, sheer quantity of work that's going on globally. Uh, so we, you know, we've got thousands of people working on it in our various centers of excellence, uh, centers of competence across the globe. Um, and I think as I alluded to in my question before, we've done loads of proof of concept, loads of minimum viable products. Um, and we have put some of those, um, more than those four here on the side, we put these out into reality. Uh, on global scale blockchain applications, and there are hundreds more um, that are that are kind of private. And we don't talk about um, because client confidentiality and so on. Um, but just to, to run through some of these ones, which are quite quite interesting. Uh, top left there, you've got IBM Food Trust, which has reduced the track and trace time on, on any food item that's inside blockchain from six days, eighteen hours, uh, to two point two seconds. And that's worth billions and billions of dollars. And that's mainly in the US at the moment, but it's, uh, you know, it's available for any food retailers in the UK should they wish to have it. Um, but those are really dramatic uh, changes in performance. And I think this is what a lot of people miss about blockchain, is it's not incremental change, it's a step change in technology. Uh, we've got Merck, uh bottom left there. Um, <coughs> You know, that, that, they handle something like a third of the globe's, globe, global trade, uh, goes through their, um, their ships and ports. And last week there was a public announcement of 92 more ports and shipping companies signed up to that. Um, and the savings alone from that equate to something like 5% of global GDP. So, so large are the numbers involved. Um, we ourselves use it, top right here in our, in our own bank, uh, IBM Global Financing. Uh, where we have saved a tremendous amount of money, $100 million. Uh, um, and down the bottom here, this is my, my uh, current pet project, the, the High Value Asset Passport in um, offshore oil and gas uh, sector. So we're looking at uh, tracking assets and building provenance records to those assets. Anything from ships to, to um, generators and what have you. So loads and loads and loads of stuff going on, and it's really cool to see. Um, but in similar vein to, to Matt's message, and I think some other messages we've heard today, this is, this is my interpretation of our statistics and what's going on. Finance, way out in the lead. You know, these guys are doing it hand over fist. A lot of it won't see. A lot of your banking is already done on the blockchain. Uh, stock exchange, insurance markets, a whole lot uh, you go going at it. Retail distribution similarly, and then sort of behind that comes the engineering stuff around, around telecoms. And we've got manufacturing, also makes aerospace and, and so on. Uh, we're starting to see it coming to chemicals and petroleum with um, force field, diamond drilling, uh, drilling well optimization, things like that. Um, and down the bottom is construction because, frankly, it, that's where it is. Right. Early conversations. I have lots of one-on-one -on -one blockchain conversations with construction companies. Um, they are, you know, they're, they're just way behind, really, really behind. And part of the problem is they don't really realise how far behind they are, because a lot of this stuff is, is kind of hidden. Um, but what? But they've got, you know, they could. We all know they're bottom of the digital stack, but they could make that leap. Um, if they took this technology up, uh, you know, make it really, really dramatically and, and save, save billions. Um, and, and one of the ways that you could do that, and one of the things that I think we've got to do is to take this conversation right back down. So um, we were talking earlier about tokenization uh, of real estate and some complex financial instruments and things like that. And there's some really cool stuff you can do with blockchain and people figuring that out and come back and walk and 
use cases, and I've got most of my own favorite ones. But actually, we need to make it really simple. Uh, because if we want the construction to take it up, I think as, as you probably alluded to, you know, the low margins, it's got to be certain, it's got to work, it's got to be easy to do, it's got to be simple to understand. Um, so it can't be tokenization. So it can just be business process optimization, just making stuff work better between you and your suppliers, your regulators, removing that friction. So if we take the, the uh, in IBM speak, the four um, features of blockchain, what it delivers, uh, consensus, tolerance, immutability, and finality, and we take those and we apply them simply to improving existing business processes where we have high friction, where there's those admin involved, where there's paperwork involved, um, there's lots of errors, usually caused by things like human intervention and human work. Um, we can save tons of this bit in the middle. Right? Friction, disputes, and time, and ultimately that's what money business is. So taking quite simple use cases is actually quite valuable. We don't need to go to the really complex stuff, although as technologists we want to go there because it's kind of cool and it's all exciting. Actually, the simple stuff is worth a tremendous amount of money. How much is it worth? Uh, well, here's some, here's some numbers. Um, this is based on, on stuff we've seen and are working on and based on predictions that we're, we're doing internally. Uh, so, so, and obviously it's, it's very large scale, but in the UK, you know, 400 billion across a 10 trillion dollar sector is up for grabs. You could build a few schools and a few more hospitals for that, finance some more businesses, up the profit margins quite a bit. You know, and there it is, you can do that today, it's not hard to do. 75% um, of disputes. The, the, you know, I used to work as a technical director of a trade association, doing a lot of analysis around uh, legal disputes in, in construction activity. And there's about 14 billion pounds locked up in disputed payments or work that's gone wrong, or maybe you didn't do it, where is the goods, all that kind of stuff. And that's that's not including all the lawyers fees and all the pain and internal hassle that disputes have. Um, and we've got evidence you can reduce disputes by 75%. You can't get rid of them entirely because there are humans involved and we like to uh, you know, make things difficult. And occasionally intentionally cause a dispute. But you can you know you can, there's another 10 billion on the table. To pick up that just by just by giving more certainty on the basis for payment. I said, did you do the job or not? Did you supply the materials or not? Where are the materials? You know that kind of stuff. Who signed? Them? When did they sign? Them? Pretty straightforward stuff. And then this one at the bottom. So this is something I'm working on with some oil and gas con uh, EPC contractors. So so they build oil rigs and stuff like that. And they're 200 to 400 million dollar programs take two to four years to build a big rig, so it's a big deal. Um, if they could reduce the time it takes to get payment for bits and pieces that they did, um, and clearly that takes the willing participation of everyone in the supply chain to make that happen, if you can do it, and you can, because blockchain can be automated, you could do it down to the last bolt or meter of weld or whatever you want to do, 85% reduction in the time from order, materials order and completion delivery, um, you know, it's worth 10 million on a project, on any one project. And that's quite a lot of money. You know, that's enough money to start another project. You know, so that's, that's more revenue, more turnover. So, referring back to, the, uh, to, to this one, uh, we've got um, some fairly straightforward uh, business use cases uh, and applying blockchain to those across the business network uh, delivers some really significant savings both for individual, um, uh, individual businesses and as a, as a sector overall. The key to it, though, is getting the business network to work together. Right? So this is, we, we can do all of that stuff already inside an enterprise. We've got ERP and ALM and PLM and all kinds of regular enterprise software that will answer all of those questions inside the single entity. So when you step outside that entity and you want to include subcontractors, your FM guys, JV, you know, whoever else is in your supply chain and you want to say, hey look, we want to work together across our contractual boundaries and we can all say, that, that collaboration thing, that's the hard part, right? Uh, 
I'm not, I've worked with destruction long enough to know we're not very collaborative. We don't, you know, we like to find a new thing and then screw our supply chain with it as hard as we can. Um, but that's not the future, right? It's not going to happen. And, and we've got evidence coming out now of platform development um, in blockchain and outside of blockchain that's saying actually there's a new tech on, on big scale that's really, really expensive and it's very unlikely that single companies will ever be able to fund it. Um, you know, unless you're Amazon or someone like that and you've got trillions in the bank. So you have to work with others to get this to function, right? And that's, that's the mindset shift, that's a leadership shift change. But if we can get there, if we can get them in the room and talking, and that's where we're at at the moment, um, then, and, and things like this is what's going to help with that, uh, then we can start forming these business networks. And there are ways in which we can take that forward, and we've done a few of those. And I got a little bit more on that in a sec. Um, but it's not quite that simple. So just getting people in the room, obviously then you've got to talk about IP, you've got to talk about the legal processes, and defining the government, things like that. Once you've done that, you've got to talk about how does this fit this blockchain thing, this simple blockchain process. It's not the complex one, but it's the simple one. How does that fit with all the other stuff you've got already? Your technical debt, your legacy, your ELP system. How do you train your people? Um, what, how do you get it onto a mobile platform? How do you secure that? How does it work with cloud? All that kind of stuff. Right, that's, that's where you know, IBM is good, because we can provide all the answers to those. But it's not a straightforward answer option. And that, that was my question to Matt, is MVPs, POCs, great, you can do them, they're isolated, they don't really interact very much with your existing systems, so it's, uh, it's kind of controlled, they're small, data sets are low, uh, data sensitivity is low, then you time, you've got to scale it, like you've got to get it big, uh, and you've got to get it big quite quickly, and that's where you run into some technical problems, but it does uh, need to fit inside digital transformation strategy as well, because this is not this is not something you do just off the cuff. It's going to take you several years. You're going to put significant money and investment into it. Um, it's going to affect nearly everything you do in your company. So how do you fit it into this? Is our our wheel of transformation? Um, but how do you fit it into your transformation strategy? And, and some of that was, was alluded to by um, just earlier. Um, so. You've got to be quite. You've got to be thinking about these things. You've got to get executive support for them. Um, you've got to get the CIO, the CTO on board, and say, "Hey, look, this is going to be part of the strategy. It's how we how we map it out." Um, so you, that's where, again, where you know, the strength and depth of your partner can can, uh, can really help. So we we see it uh, rolling out like this. Um, so just taking the simple use cases, you choose your technology partner. If you have, yeah, perhaps one of our that's a able competition. <laughs> um, you form a, a, a network of maybe two or three companies because you've got to keep it quite constrained at the start. Those, those companies will fund it, we will invest, we can invest, we have a bank, we will invest in it, we are investing in blockchain. Um, and those founding members set up the governments, create the blockchain uh, and make it work inside, them, inside their own business processes. Once they've done that, and you can do that because it's control, you bring in your normal competing um, people. So uh, perhaps they're similar businesses, but they work geographically differently, so you don't, you don't interact, or they, they work in a slightly different place to you, or, or whatever. But non-competitive um, secondary members of the network come on board. How they go on board, they could be um, software as a service, uh, they could be equity holders in it, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you start to see the value is accruing to the people in the middle, um, which is the message to our clients is getting early and set it up. Because once you've gone beyond that, you get to dominating platforms. That's when you get to um, the, the, you know, the Google and the Amazon status. And there's a good example of that in South America, uh, where three companies set up a construction platform, and now 60% of all construction supply goes through that platform in Brazil. Uh, so by working together, being collaborative, setting up the network, they now have not only the direct benefits of their own business of, of operating better, but they're now selling this as a service uh, beyond it, 
and then of course you'll find, hey, we've got loads of data here, what do we do with the data? Um, it's valuable. There's probably tons of applications that no one has ever thought of yet that we've we'll built on top of that. So value approved to the people in the middle um, and it grows out over time. And that's where that's where you've got to get the scaling right, get the security right, uh, and so on. So uh, I think in uh, in very quick nutshell that is that's our message is let's start simple um, let's keep it pretty straightforward because there's enough challenges on the road anyway um, but there is now expertise available out there to help companies make these things happen um, and we view it as a collaborative play uh, that is going to be it's going to work you know, very few companies will make this work on their own and if we do it, there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of gains to be made for, for everyone.